Welcome back, everyone. This is going to be our lecture on Chapter 10, which is entitled Patterns of Inheritance. So now that we have perused certain chapters, hopefully we have all become familiar with not only the concept of DNA being our genetic code, but the fact that our DNA is represented in our 46 chromosomes or our 23 pairs as diploid organisms. Now, a quick reminder, within those chromosomes, you will have genes, which are certain portions of DNA that we can utilize for transcription and translation. So what Chapter 10 is going to explore is how exactly the homologous chromosomes are able to separate during gametes and what it then needs during fertilization for the genotype and the phenotype of the offspring. The genotype will reference the amount of genes that are inherited from the parent, and the phenotype will discuss the physical or behavioral attributes that we see in the organism based on the genes that were passed down from its maternal and paternal strings. We're going to start introducing some of the concepts of genetics in this chapter as well, and we can't really start without introducing Gregor Mendel. You might have heard the name before. Mendel is often referred to as the father of genetics, because his work in the 19th century was instrumental for us to see that as parental gametes were selected, we could make predictions as to what the offspring would look like or behave. His work initially started with peas. Um, he loved to um, plant. He had an avid garden growing, and he would keep meticulous notes. And in his notes, he talked about the fact that when working with his peas, if he was very careful in selecting the parental offspring, I'm sorry, the parental strand, he could make predictions as to what the next generations of peas would look like. And his experiments were all centered around either self-fertilization or cross-fertilization. So for instance, right here, we have an image of some of his pea plants. And what it's trying to highlight is that what he would do is he noticed that the pea plants, when it came to um, something like height, he would either have a tall, or a short pea plant. And he wanted to see if that trait was determined based on the fertilization that would be occurring. So in this example, what he did is that he would go ahead and remove part of the stamens, which are the male reproductive parts of the plant. And in this case, he chose a short pea plant. And then he went ahead and transferred the of a tall pea plant over to the short one. And as the next generation came about, what he started seeing is that you would have some offspring that were tall and some that were short. And based on his notes, he indicated that there must be some kind of feature, some type of entity that allows the control over what type of height the offspring would show. Now, keep in mind, this was before the discovery of DNA, so he wasn't really sure what to call it, but he wrote excessively in his journals. And based on that, nowadays, we know a lot about how our gametes work. Now, the other thing I wanted to point out is based on Mendel's work, we also came about to see that what is passed on from your parents in our genes can either be described as a dominant or a recessive allele. A dominant allele means that as soon as you inherit one copy of it, you will always see its effect in the phenotype or the physical attributes. A recessive allele means that the effects can be masked or hidden, and they will only show through if both parents pass along that recessive allele. So dominant allele, as long as you have one, you show the particular trait. Recessive, you will only show the trait if both of your copies inherited are recessive. If you inherit one dominant and one recessive, that would then mean that even though you carry both of the alleles, the dominant one will determine the phenotype or the physical attribute. In fact, we can take out a picture like this where we see our pea plants and we see that the peas either come in a green color or a yellow color. And what we're going to observe here is that we're going to do a little bit of self-fertilization. Self-fertilization basically means that you cross the same parental genes in both sides, so from the quote-unquote mom and dad side. And what you end up with, as you can see here, is that if we cross, I'm sorry, self-fertilize the green peas, that the offspring all have green peas. If you mix and match 
the yellow with themselves, then what we see is we have two options. We have all yellow, or we can see the majority yellow with one green. Now, in this case, you notice that at the bottom of the description, they went ahead and said that if all green and all yellow is seen, just as the parent plant, we like to reference that as true, ble uh, true breeding. Self-fertilization leaves offspring with the same seed color as the parent. A hybrid is when self-fertilization occurs and we get a mix of colors, mostly colors that we saw in the parent, but also others that were not seen or that were masked. That would be a very nice example of having a recessive and a dominant allele. So how would we go about indicating if an organism has two of the same or one of one and one of the other? Well, what we can do is when discussing the genotype or the genes of an organism, we can reference them as homozygous or heterozygous. Homozygous means that both copies are the same. So that means you can be homozygous dominant or you could be homozygous recessive. Either way, both of the copies or both of the alleles inherited from the parent, mom and dad, are identical. So homozygous means both copies are the same. And then on your end, you have to find out, does that mean that both copies are dominant, homozygous dominant, or are they recessive, homozygous recessive? If you inherit one of each, then that is going to be referenced as heterozygous. Heterozygous automatically means that you indicate or that you inherit a dominant and one recessive trait. Now remember, according to that rule, that will mean that if you are homozygous dominant, then the phenotype that will show through will be the dominant gene. So in this case right here, we're back to our piece. And as you can see what they've done, they went ahead and they used the letter G as a, let's call it a symbol or a marking. And you can see that in some cases it is capitalized and in some cases it is lowercase. And this would be a really nice point to point out that whenever you're doing your genotype and you want to abbreviate it, you can pick the letter. And if you capitalize the letter, you automatically indicate that it is a dominant gene. If you take that same letter and you lowercase it, then that is your symbol that it's going to be a recessive trait. So here we can see that for our yellow and our green, the yellow is dominant. How do we know that? Because if I take a look at the genotype, I notice that if I'm homozygous dominant, meaning both copies are dominant, notice the capital G, the phenotype, the physical attribute is yellow. If I do heterozygous, that means one of each, notice how there's one capital and one lowercase. Um, hint, the capital one always goes first. Whenever you have a heterozygous mix, the dominant trait is the one that will show through in the phenotype. And here you go. You have the yellow again. So how exactly do you get green peas? Well, in order to get green peas, that means that you need to have two copies of the recessive trait. So remember, if the copies are the same, we call it homozygous. So here in our examples, we see a homozygous recessive genotype. Notice the two lowercase g's, which means that this recessive gene now is free to show in the phenotype. Hence, we get our green colored peas. So on the slide, it highlights the fact that the phenotype is the observable characteristic. So are you looking at a tall or short one? a green or a yellow pea? Are you looking at a brown, a red, a blonde, a black hair color? Any type of physical attributes or even behavioral models, even some disease models would fall under the phenotype. And the phenotype is the end result of the interaction of the environment as well as the genes. Remember the genes is our genotype. Is it homozygous or both the same or is it heterozygous? one of each. Now, as you're doing your reading, you might also come across the term wild type. Wild type is what they like to call um, the most commonly seen version of the gene. And then a mutant is any type of variation that steps away from what the wild type was meant to be. Now, as you're also looking through your pictures, you're going to notice that oftentimes when we're looking at 
laws of inheritance, we want to follow the genes through several generations. So there's going to be an indicator of P if we're looking at the first generation. This is the parental generation. F1 will be the first generation that comes after the P generation. And then the F2 would be the offspring of F1. So it's sort of like thinking about your grandparents as P, your parents as F, and then you as F2. And often what we can see is we can also have some fun with it by taking a look at some good old fashioned Punnett squares. Now a Punnett square is a simple construct where you draw yourself a little square right here. And as you can see, it's been subdivided in four because what you wanna do is you wanna take a look at the gametes that the parents bring and you wanna predict what the genotype and the phenotype of the offspring is going to be. So right here, we're looking at a very simple structure because we're doing a monohybrid cross or a monohybrid Punnett square. That is means that you're only looking at one gene. So in this case, we're going to go ahead and we're going to take a look once again at the color so we can see the female parent and the male parent. Now, both of these are going to be heterozygous. So that means that if we're looking at their genotype, we should see a capital and a lowercase, which we do. Now, keep in mind, this is the diploid representation. When you do the Punnett square, what you're going to do is you're going to go from diploid to haploid. Thank you, meiosis. So we're going to split the letters, and as you can see, the female will either carry a capital G or a lowercase g, and the male will do the same, either a capital G or a lowercase g. And you're going to position the haploid gametes on top and on the side to represent the egg and the sperm that the parents are producing. And then to figure out what the kids are going to be, you're gonna do a little bit of multiplication. So if this egg meets up with this sperm, here's baby number one, homozygous dominant. If this egg meets up with this sperm, then we get baby number two, a heterozygous mix. Notice once again, how the capital letter comes first and of course, the dominant one will determine the phenotype. So you can see it is nice and yellow. And you do that all the way around. So you go back to the top and you take this capital G, mix it with the lowercase sperm at the bottom, and we get another heterozygous mix. But the lowercase g on top can also mix with the lowercase g in the sperm. And here we have our homozygous recessive trait. So we get our little green P that makes an appearance. Oftentimes when you're doing a Punnett square, what you're doing is you're making a prediction. What is the likelihood of this particular ratio or this particular trait to appear? You're gonna notice that on our PowerPoints, we have our genotype ratio, which takes a look at all the different versions of the offspring. And as you can see, this one is a ratio of one to two to one. So one starts off with how many homozygous dominants you have. The two or the middle number will take a look at the heterozygous mix. And then the final number takes a look at the homozygous recessive trait. You can also do a phenotypical ratio. And when you do a monohybrid cross with a heterozygous mix, you will always end up with a three to one phenotype ratio. That means that three of the potential offsprings will have, in this case, the yellow color and one will have the green color. So that would mean that your predictive power would say that there is a three out of four or 75% chance that offspring will have yellow color and a one out of four or 25% chance that the offspring will have green color. The nice thing about this monohybrid cross is that we're able to kind of track the inheritance of one gene and if we're trying to figure out what one parent brings to the table, we can go ahead and do a test cross. A test cross is when you link or you match a homorecessive offspring, or I should say, my apologies, a homorecessive parent with an unknown individual. What do I mean with that? Well, let's take a look at our pictures. So here we can see that we have two scenarios. In both of the scenarios, the male gametes are homozygous recessive. See how you have two of the lowercase y's? Now, what's the female bringing to the party? Well, we have two options. Option one is that the female is homozygous dominant. So that means two capital Y's. 
So as you can see, the gametes have been separated. And then the offspring has been determined by crossing the gametes from top to the side. The second option is if the female is heterozygous. That means that they have one capital and one lowercase. Once again, the gametes are done. And then we do our crosses. Now notice how you will get two different offspring. If the female is homozygous dominant, that will then mean that you have a 100% chance that the offspring will be not only heterozygous, but also 100% yellow in its phenotypical appearance. On the other hand, if the female is heterozygous, that will then mean that not only do you get a 50-50% chance that you are either homozygous recessive or heterozygous, you also get the appearance of yellow and green. So you get the appearance of both the dominant and the recessive trait. Now keep in mind, this kind of emphasizes the fact that when we do our Punnett squares, we highlight the fact that we go from a diploid to a haploid cell as we switch over to the production of our germline cells or our sex cells, the eggs, and of course the sperm cells. This is also highlighted in what we like to call Mendel's Law of Segregation. Mendel's Law of Segregation highlights the fact that even though we get two alleles, we get two versions of each gene, one from mom, one from dad, when it's time for us to produce our gametes, those two alleles have to segregate or separate. And remember, when we had our discussion about meiosis one, we talked about the fact that the purpose of it was to separate the homologous chromosomes. And as these homologous chromosomes separate, not only are we able to go from diploid to haploid, we're also able to go ahead and create representations of the individual alleles separate from the pairs that formed when they were doing their homologous formation. Mendel's law of segregation is also very heavily studied when we take a look at certain disease models where we have a different phenotype depending on if there is a what we call a carrier or a diseased individual. Most of the time, a carrier will indicate the fact that this um, person, or I should say organism, is a heterozygous mix, meaning that they have one mutated copy, so one copy of the disease, and one healthy copy. So they're a carrier of the disease, but they don't show the symptoms of the disease. Disease will only come into play in our scenario if you have a homozygous recessive inheritance which means that both parents would individually have to pass on the gene for the disease and the offspring or the child would inherit both mutated copies, hence showcasing the symptoms that goes with the full-blown disease. This is what we see, for instance, in cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis is a respiratory disease where our mucus cells, especially in the respiratory lining, are not able to fully pump out chloride, which means the mucus that collects in these orifices, in these openings, kind of sits there too long, harboring lots of bacteria, which could be very detrimental to the quality of our inhale and exhale, as well as of our life. So as we can see right here in our Punnett square, cystic fibrosis comes along only when the child, the offspring, inherits two copies of the mutated gene. So the, parent, the offspring has to be homozygous recessive. In this particular Punnett square, we could see that both mom and dad are what they call carriers. And a carrier means that they have one mutated, here's mom, one mutated, here's dad, and one normal or wild type gene. So they have the inkling for the disease, but they do not show the symptoms. When we now see that mom and dad go from diploid to haploid and produce their gametes, when it's time to produce their Punnett square, you can see that they can create healthy nun carriers in the case of homozygous dominant, which means both copies are wild type, both copies are quote unquote healthy. They can create a heterozygous mix, which would allow for additional carriers to be introduced. And you can also see that you can have a chance of having an effective child. 
Now the option, or I should say the chance of having an effective child is one out of four or 25%. Right, that would be this one right here, 25%. In addition, they would have a 25% of having a healthy nun carrier, one out of four, and they would have a two out of four or 50% chance of having a healthy carrier. Now, I know you're probably going, well, this is all nice, but don't we have thousands upon thousands of genes? And you would be completely correct in that. The human body has anywhere from 20 to 23,000 genes. So doing a monohybrid cross doesn't really help us a lot. We have to figure out how these genes interact with each other. Do they move together? Do they move independently? So there are options to do Punnett squares that involve more than one gene. Um, the one above the monohybrid is going to be the dihybrid cross. And the dihybrid cross, as you can see by the name, we're taking a look at how two genes are able to pass from one generation to the next. Now, keep in mind that these two genes move independently from each other. So we have to keep that in mind when we're setting up our gametes. Let me go ahead and show you a picture of a Punnett square for a dihybrid. Now, in this case, we're going to start off with the F1 generation. And what we're doing is we are crossing um, a homozygous recessive female and a homozygous dominant male. Now, one thing I want to point out is notice how you have the R's bundled together and the Y bundled together. The R's will represent if the P is round or wrinkled. As you can see, round with the capital R is the dominant. And then the wrinkled is the lowercase r for recessive. And the second trait we're going to look at is if they're going to be yellow or green. You've seen that before. Now, when it was just one letter, all we did is we just kind of divided them, right? We took our little y's, we put one y here, the other y here. But since we're doing two genes, we also have to divide up the r, and we have to match them up with the y's. So as you can see, these two r's, since they're both lowercase, it doesn't matter how you twist or turn. The only possible combination is that a lowercase r is matched with a lowercase y. Same thing happens with that, but in this case, he has the capital ones. No matter how you twist or turn it, a capital R will always end up with a capital Y, just because those are the options that are shown. Now, when you come and take a look at the offspring, remember, we're multiplying, right? So if the R and the Y from the female come together with the R and the Y from the male, what we see happening is that the R's will get bundled together. Here's your heterozygous mix. And the Y's will get bundled together. And that's because these two genes are moving independently from each other. So the R's stay together and the Y's stay together. In fact, when we go and take a look at our F2 generation and we take heterozygous gametes from both genes, this is where it then gets really interesting because you now have different options for the R and the Y to max up. So the capital R and the capital Y can pair up. Here's option number one. But the capital R can also pair up with the lowercase y. Option number two, the lowercase r can match up with the capital Y. And in case you're wondering, hey, why is the capital letter not first? Well, remember, these are two separate genes. So two separate genes are usually indicated in alphabetical order. And then you don't have to worry about if the second letter is capital or not because you're just constricting to which letter comes first in the alphabet. And of course, the lowercase r can also be paired with the lowercase y. So we have four options for the gametes, and mom is doing the same exact thing, four options. So notice how we now have a Punnett square that gives us 16 options for offspring, 16 different options that the r's and the y's can be reunited in diploid format. When you do a cross, I should say a dihybrid cross on a heterozygous parent, what you end up with is a phenotypical ratio that's known as nine to three to three to one. And when you add that up, you're going to see that you're gonna have your 16 choices that you're looking at. So as you can see from the phenotypical ratio, nine will be smooth, and yellow, three 
it will be smooth and green and wrinkled and yellow and one will be fully recessive which is wrinkled and green fully recessive with both trays here is another law that we take a look at this one is the law of independent assortment and independent support basically says that whenever we're looking at different alleles if the alleles <coughs> are moving are going from diploid to haploid they do not have to move as a unit this is usually seen when the genes are what we call unlinked meaning that they're located at different parts or different chromosomes when it's time for these chromosomes to separate you do not need to move the dominant gene with the dominant gene or the recessive gene with the recessive gene. And this is what we were highlighting on the fact that when we made our dihybrid cross, that we were looking for all the possible combinations that the R's and the Y's can mix together. So law of independent assortment basically says that when it's time for you to make your egg or your sperm cell, your gametes, the segregation of alleles for one gene does not influence the alleles from another gene. And that is all based on the fact that the genes are going to be on different chromosomes. Now, when you do your Punnett square for more than two genes, it gets a little bit difficult because it's a lot of genes to keep track of. And as you can imagine, the Punnett square just keeps getting larger and larger and larger. So there's this thing called the product rule. And the product rule basically says, and I'll read it right off our PowerPoint right here, says the chance that two independent events will both occur equals the product of the individual chances that each event will occur. So we're going to apply a little bit of math, a little bit of statistics to take a look at the interaction, or I should say the independent assortment of genes that are higher in quantity than two. Because as you can imagine, it's going to get really tricky if you have to take a look at three genes. So here we can see the product rule at work. And we're taking a look at the chances of the R, the Y, and the T allele interacting with each other. And as you can see right here, by doing our calculations, we can see that the probability of the offspring being heterozygous for all three is going to be one half times one half times one half equals one over eight. So this is the product rule, multiplying the individual chances to see what the cumulative or overall chance will be for a particular genotype and a phenotype. Now, some genes will not follow these rules, and that's because some genes are on the same chromosomes, and some genes are what we call linked. If the gene is linked, that means that they cannot independently assort because they move as a unit based on their location and their linkage. So this is a little bit of a abnormality, or I shouldn't say an abnormality, a deviation from what Mendel was talking about. So here, for instance, we have an example of how your Punnett square will differ if you're doing a gene that is not linked. As you can see right here, you have a gene, the P and the L, and you see that they're on two separate chromosomes. The P's are on the tall one, the L's are on the shorter one, which means that they're gonna follow Mendel's law of independent assortment. So we're gonna have our four different versions that they can interact with. Now take a look at your second scenario. In this scenario, the genes are linked. When they're linked, that usually means that they're on the same chromosome and that they will move as a unit. So no matter how you twist or turn, the P and the L cannot separate and cannot mix with each other. You have to move them as a unit. So as you can see, that will have one Gabby that's a capital P and a capital L, and another one that is a lower P and a lowercase L. No mixing and matching of these options because they are linked. And as you can imagine, this will cause changes in the result of our dihybrid cross if the gene is a linked gene or not linked. 
Now also keep in mind that if the genes are linked, we could still see a little bit of variety or genetic diversity because as you may recall, um, crossing over can occur. Crossing over can occur during meiosis, more particular in prophase one of meiosis. And if this crossing over occurs, it allows the genes, or I should say the alleles, to create variety. You might remember that in our previous chapter, we discussed crossing over, and we talked about the fact that we can have, at the end of meiosis, when the four haploid cells are produced, we can have parental chromatids, and we can have recombinant chromatids. Parental chromatids will indicate that the homologous chromosome separated without having any crossing over. So you can see they're indicated here by being either fully blue or fully pink. But when crossing over occurs and you get the mixing and the matching, well, in that case, you get the two colors. That means that you get a recombinant set. A recombinant set means it's a representation of both of the parents in one haploid sample. Now, this is also the part where I tell you that the majority of our genes do not follow the dominant and the recessive format. And part of that is because we have so many genes that their interaction isn't always as predictable as we would like it to be. There are also some non-Mendelian behaviors that we can see in gene expression. And two of them are what I would like to discuss next. They're called incomplete dominance and co-dominance. Incomplete dominance is what we see on our picture right here, and it basically indicates the fact that if you have two separate alleles, so here we have red flowers versus white flowers, when they are crossed together, we don't see the appearance of a dominant or a recessive, so either all red or all white. Instead, what you will get is you will get a third phenotype, a mixture of both. So in this case, when you mix red and white, you will get the pink coloring. And this is then called incomplete dominance. When a heterozygous mix, so a mix of both of the alleles, will indicate a hybrid or a mixture of those particular phenotypes. Look at that, isn't that beautiful? So mixing the pink, I'm sorry, mixing the red and the white will get you pink flowers. And in case you're wondering, well, what if I take those pink flowers which are showing me my hybrid phenotype, but from a genotype are heterozygous, right? They carry a red and a white gene. Well, when you cross them, then what we see happening is when the red genes reunite, you get a red flower. When the white genes reunite, you get a white flower. And wherever you have that mixed group, you have your pink flowers. This is incomplete dominance. Co-dominance, as the name indicates, is when both traits are represented. Both traits are expressed together. And probably the best example of that is going to be our ABO blood typing. So when you determine blood typing, you can do it many different ways. In the United States, the most popular one is to take a look at if you have genes for the A, the B, or the O phenotype. And the way it's going to work is that A and B are co-dominant, O is recessive. So this then means that when we take a look at the phenotype, the appearance of someone's blood type, we can say that they have type A, meaning that they are homozygous for A, so they inherited two A's, one from each parent, or they're heterozygous, meaning they inherit one A from one parent and an O from the other parent. Same thing seen in B. If someone is blood type B, they could be BB or BO. And if you only inherit O's, well, then you are type O. There you go. Now, what happens if you inherit an A and a B? Both of these are dominant, and because it is co-dominant, that means that you then become blood type AB. So both of them get to shine through. So A, B is an example of co-dominance, where you have the representation of both of the dominant alleles together. So not a mixture, that was incomplete. Co-dominance, both of them get to shine through independently.
There's also this expression called pleiotropy. Pleiotropy is when one gene has a multiple effect on different phenotypes. So one gene controls multiple symptoms, multiple physical attributes. We see this, for instance, in the disease called Marvin syndrome, where a mutation in a single gene, in a single protein, allows for many different symptoms to appear. So here we can see that the mutation causes for a defect in your particular protein, or I should say a mutation in a particular protein, which then goes and affects different parts of the body, such as the eye, bones and joints, the hearts and the lungs. And here in blue, you can see an extensive list of some of the symptoms that the patient will encounter. All of this is due to one mutation. So this is called pleiotropy, with one mutated gene causes multiple phenotypical events to occur. We can also have this thing called epistasis. Epistasis is when one gene affects the expression of another gene. So in order for you to see the true potential of a secondary gene, we have to see what the primary gene is doing. Let me show you an example of this and we can revisit our ABO blood typing for this. So when you look at your ABO blood typing, as I was mentioning before, we see that A and B are co-dominant. But to truly be represented in the phenotype, we see that not only do we need to have the gene, the A, the B, or the O, we also need to have a connector molecule. This connector molecule is gonna allow for the A, the B, or the O antigen to attach itself. And really, it's gonna allow for the A and the B to attach itself to the surface of the red blood cell. If something happens and this gene, the connector gene is absent, it doesn't allow the surface molecule to attach. And this is how we get type O. Type O is called our naked red blood cell because our body can't figure out if it has an A or a B. And that's because of epistasis because the absence of one gene controls the presence or the absence of another gene. So because the H molecule isn't there or the H gene isn't there, then the A or the B can also not be represented. We also have what we call sex-linked genes. Sex-linked genes means that they are dependent or they affect one sex more than the other. This is usually seen due to the fact that the mutation is going to be carried on either the X or the Y. Most of the disease models that we have are what we call autosomal. So things like Huntington's disease, cystic fibrosis. Autosomal means once again that they can affect chromosomes one through 22, which means that they can affect both sexes equally. In the case of a sex-linked gene, one sex is affected more than the other. And most of the time, it's going to involve a mutation in our X chromosome. And what we see happening is that the mutation occurs in the X chromosome. That means that the boys are more at risk, or I should say the genetic males are more at risk of inheriting disease because they only get one X. And if they inherit the mutated X, they automatically have the disease. Females might have the option to be a carrier if the disease is a recessive type, because if they inherit one mutated and one wild type X, it can be silenced. The, uh, the disease can be silenced because the wild type, the quote unquote healthy version of the X has also been passed down. So for instance, here you can see your reminder of how X and Y determine your biological sex. Because at the end of the day, what we see is that females have two X's. So no matter how you twist or turn, the X is passed on in their gametes, whereas males technically have 50% X and 50% Y. So it is the male who determines the sex of the child because the female only brings the X's. And if the male then says, here's another X, you get girls. And if he says, hey, here's a Y, then we get our boys, a one in two or a 50% chance of either. Now, as I said to you before, <laughs> one of the reasons why most of these disease models will affect the X chromosome is purely based on its size. 
It turns out that the X chromosome is significantly larger than the Y chromosome, and that's because it does have um, a lot of the genes that we need for development, so to go from zygote to embryo to fetus. The Y chromosome really just is shorter, but that's okay because its largest, its most important role is what we call the SRY gene, which is the sex determining gene, which allows for the baby, or I should say the zygote, to develop its reproductive structures being of the male affinity. The default sex for uh, humans is female, and that's because the X chromosome has all the directions for the development. It is only when the Y chromosome is introduced that we then see that the genetic male is determined. So here's an example of what they call an X-linked recessive disorder. Now, recessive means that in order for you to have the full-blown disease, you need to inherit two copies or it's the only copy that you get. The reason I say that is because remember, since we're talking about the X chromosome, if we're looking at a male, a male only gets one X. A female gets two Xs. So let's take a look at our Punnett square. Let's see. It says the female shows a recessive X-linked trait and the male expresses whatever is on his only X. So we're going to take a look at an example of hemophilia. Hemophilia A, to be specific, is an X-linked recessive disorder that affects the blood clotting capability of the body. And we're looking at mom who is heterozygous, which means she's a carrier, meaning one healthy and one deceased. And dad is completely healthy. So here you can see his X, because this is only found on the X, is healthy. If both healthy gametes meet up, you have a healthy daughter, because they're going to get two Xs. If the daughter inherits one of dad and one of the mutated versions of mom, we're going to go ahead and we're going to get a carrier. But remember, the carrier doesn't show the disease, so they're still healthy. Now, when it comes to the son, we have to be careful because if the son inherits the healthy copy of mom's ex, the son is nice and healthy, beautiful. But if the son inherits the mutated copy of the ex from mom, they will automatically have the disease. This is also what we see in, for instance, colorblindness. Does that then mean that you can never have a female who has hemophilia or a female who is colorblind? No, it doesn't mean that at all. But in order for the female to have hemophilia A, because there is a type of hemophilia that affects both sexes, but in order for the female to have the sex linked recessive disorder, that would mean that she would have to inherit a mutated copy for both mom and dad. So that would mean that dad would know that he has the disease because remember, he only carries one X chromosome. We also have this thing called X inactivation. X inactivation is usually seen when you have the presence of two Xs, and that is because of the double doses of protein. Now, males usually don't have to worry about it because once again, they get an X or they get a Y, right? But females get two Xs. So if we want to follow the genetic expression of the gene, since we get two copies of everything, what can happen is that the female cells can shut off one of the X's. And the way they're going to do that is by condensing it very tightly and creating this thing called a bar body. This is usually done at random, meaning that you can't predict which X in which cell will get shut down. And this is often seen, or I should see studies have been done excessively to highlight the bar body use in calico cats. The calico cats are the ones that have the orange and the brown patches of fur, and that is all dependent on which X randomly gets activated and deactivated. So as you can see in our picture, if the black fur is turned into a bar body, then you will get patches of orange. And if the orange fur is turned into a bar body, you will get the patches of the black and the patches form at an irregular pattern because once again, the cells at random will shut off one X versus the other. We also know that there's genes on autosomal chromosomes. So that indicates that it can affect both males 
and females on an equal basis. In the case of the autosomal gene, it's very important to figure out if it is a dominant or a recessive trait. <coughs> Excuse me. If it's a dominant trait, that means that it will consistently get passed down because once again, the inheritance of just one of the mutations will cause the disease and all its symptoms to appear. If it is a recessive disorder, then there's a chance that you might have generations where you have carriers that display a normal phenotype and the disease might skip a generation only to make an appearance again once the carriers go ahead and produce their gametes and potentially pass on that mutation to their offspring. In the cases of autosomal diseases, they will often go ahead and create what they call pedigree charts. And a pedigree chart basically means that we track the interaction of the female and the male. The female is usually indicated by the circle, the male by the square, and as you can see here, they're looking at different disease models. And notice how some of the squares are fully colored in and some are only half. Whenever you see the appearance of the fully colored in ones, that usually indicates that they are affected. When they are half colored in, that means that you're looking at a carrier. The pedigree maps allow us to see if it's an autosomal disease, because if it's autosomal, that will mean that, I'm sorry, I should say a dominant autosomal disease. If it's dominant, that means that it will make an appearance in every single one of the generations. If it is recessive, we see that there are some generations where you will only have carriers, indicating that it's quote unquote skipping a generation because both parents would have to pass on that mutation for the offspring to be fully affected. The other thing that I definitely should mention is that the environment also can alter our phenotype. In fact, you might have heard the saying nature versus nurture. The truth of the matter is, is that a lot of our phenotypical appearances are a combination of the genes and the environment. One of the things that we see is that temperature, for instance, can affect certain phenotypes. Um, and I would like to stick to the one with the Siamese cat, the little picture you can see right there. So Siamese cats, they will go ahead and develop these darkened patches over their body once the temperature reaches about 30 degrees Celsius. When they're initially born, because the womb has a very nice warm temperature, they tend to be all white. And as they're introduced into cooler temperatures, you'll see the darkening of the patches that start to form. So this would be a beautiful example of how the environment can alter a particular phenotype. The last thing I want to mention for this particular chapter is um, we mentioned pleiotropy, which was that one gene determines multiple phenotypes. This one is going to be polygenetic. A polygenetic trait is when you have a trait that is dependent on more than one gene. So the phenotype will really just reflect the activities of multiple genes working together. And the truth of the matter, things like our eye color, our hair color, our skin color, our height, our muscle composition, these all follow on their polygenetic trait, where we rely on the interactions of many of our genes to play together to create the diversity that we see in all our different phenotypes. All righty, I will end it there. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, please do not hesitate to reach out. And we shall meet again soon. Bye.